Thanks everyone for having me. Um, so I'm going to get started with uh, a poll by just raising your hands. Who here knows what I mean when I say multimodality monitoring? Who has used it clinically here? Besides Lisa, you're not allowed to raise your hand. Huya, Gabe, uh, you don't count, and Casey, you don't count. Anyone else? <laughs> All right, so we have an uphill battle for the next 20 minutes. Um, uh, what I mean by this is a conglomerate of different methods that we can use to augment kind of what we have at the bedside. Um, so first we have to acknowledge that when someone's in the ICU, they're really sick, especially in our neuroscience ICU, that their neuro exam is pretty limited. Um, I can't tell you how many times Lisa's come up to me and said, yeah, they're not doing anything. What does that mean? It's very hard. We need a lot of data to be able to support what is actually going on inside that person's head to be able to support them. Um, something else we have to do is identify the appropriate patients, which is a whole gray area and a lot of variability, about who would benefit from enhancing the neuromonitoring other than just kind of looking at their pupils every hour at bedside. Um, I'm going to talk briefly about some of the neuromonitoring techniques that are more kind of mainstream, a little bit more commonly used. We'll skip a lot of the research-based stuff because there's a lot of it and there's a lot of interesting stuff going on that just is way beyond the scope of 20 minutes. Um, and then kind of introduce really what the next stage is when you're putting together thousands of data points a second, um, how we take that and actually put that into a clinical context where it can start to really help people. So, um, question one, what types of neurological injured patients would benefit from augmented multimodality monitoring? I'm going to give you a second before I pull this up. So severe TBI, high-grade subarachnoid hemorrhage, status epilepticus, or all of the above. Anyone? All right, all of the above. Thank you for everyone answering. So, what will be... Um, so we're accepting that the neurologic examination has limitations at the bedside, especially for our severely neurologically injured patients. We're identifying at least a few subsets that really we can start narrowing in on and trying to see what other avenues we have to be able to monitor that includes severe TBIs. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about the methods that we use, especially Grady, it's exciting things coming that way. Um, High-grade subarachnoid hemorrhages and stuff. Um, methods that we're using primarily at UH. Um, ICH not so much, and then status epilepticus, and really what I mean by that is people on the ictal interictal continuum where you're not sure if their patterns are truly malignant or if they're not. Um, and there's been some talk about using different strategies to be able to see if there's a metabolic demand that actually means if that EEG is meaningful to treat or if you should just watch. Um, some clinical limitations that we all have at the bedside is our patients are sedated, they're paralyzed for a variety of different reasons, whether it's respiratory, it's because it's ICP, um, and you know, kind of limited by basic pressure monitors, which I'll briefly talk about. Um, so this idea is to make a bundle of enhanced devices so we can get a ton of data and then try to figure out what the heck to do with it at some point. Um, and what we're talking about is two different areas. You're talking about the macro and the micro level. Um, you're talking about ICP, pressures, perfusion, but then you kind of also care what's happening at the cellular level. And how to integrate those two concepts is a bit challenging. Um, and really, uh, when you're talking about putting a ton of monitors in someone's head, it's not really the monitor that's doing anything. It's actually your response to it. So we have to figure out how to respond to these numbers that we get. So some of the parameters that I'm sure some of you have heard um, that we're interested in, and this is a very short list. Um, I have to condense it because honestly it could be extraordinarily long. Um, ICP is just the basic ICP and cerebral per uh, perfusion pressure. Things that you can easily monitor with any sort of uh, ventriculostomy device. And things that we monitor in our ICUs pretty standardly now. The problem is, do we really care about perfusion? Or do you care about blood flow? You actually care about blood flow. You care about what's getting into the brain, actually, in terms of blood substrate, right? And so we've been monitoring perfusion pressure, but we probably need better ways to be able to monitor blood flow. We'll talk about some novel uh, things that are going on for that. You can talk about on a cellular level, lactate pyrate issues, things that d demonstrate metabolic demand on the brain that you can maybe target with different therapies. Um, we're talking about Lycox, the PPTO2, uh, brain tissue oxygenation tension, 
Um, and then you talk about auto-regulation, which would be great to know exactly what's going on in someone's head and how their arterials are responding differently, either differently in different areas or different than you versus a sick patient, and be able to identify actually what's an adequate pressure to be able to perfuse their brain. So some, these are some of the parameters we're talking about. Um, and ways that we achieve those are through just a traditional intracranial pressure. Contract. Talk about all these kind of in detail. Um, EEG is really helpful, um, especially if you can put it intracranial. Cerebral microdialysis, talking about metabolic demand, talking about things that are on the cellular level. Um, there's pros and cons to that. Brain tissue oxygenation. Um, and then the other three are a little bit not ready for prime time and or have complications, including NEARS, near infrared, uh, infrared spectroscopy, uh, which we're running a trial over at UH currently, and we've enrolled one patient so far, because it just started last week, um, to be able to assess blood flow and then response to different uh, therapies that you're delivering. Um, thermal diffusion thermometry and then jugular ball oximetry, either really ready for prime time or not used for a variety of reasons. So I won't focus on those. So, Anyone that's done trauma, anyone that's been around the neuro ICU, the bread and butter that you've seen traditionally is intracranial pressure monitor. Either an external ventriculostomy device that goes straight to the ventricle, that can be there therapeutic as well, or you know, a bolt that's intracranial and measures direct pressure from that site. Um, most of the time, ventriculostomy is beneficial because you can be therapeutic, you can drain, you have CSF diversion, you can place intrathecal medications through that. Um, the, Waveform can be useful, be able to demonstrate compliance, among other things, just watching the patient at bedside and be able to see how they respond to different clinical means, you'll be able to see how their compliance is and be able to, to demonstrate, um, have some idea where they are in terms of uh, their ability to compensate for change. Um, you know, the dramatic brain uh, guidelines are really kind of where most of the information for recommending ICP monitoring uh, takes place. Um, you know, GCS greater than eight, I mean less than eight, excuse me. Um, normal NCT is really the most important thing, and I think the controversial part that we always run into is um, someone who has a media, an outcome that is warrants aggressive therapy. Um, should, you know, at the end stage of brain injury, who should be really, should we be uh, putting monitors or not? It's always kind of hard, something that we uh, have a hard time dealing with. The rest of it's pretty straightforward. Um, one of the better things that's going to be coming out, hopefully, um, and we're going to be um, doing one of these at the, uh, studies at UH is more non-invasive options. Um, be able to monitor ICP in someone without necessarily placing a device inside their brain itself. Um, so that's kind of down the research pipeline. Well, whether it will replace CBDs, I doubt it, um, because of the therapeutic options as well. Um, but non-invasive ICP monitors are on the horizon. Um, and we'll see how that pans out. Something that a lot of us are familiar with is the increasing ordering of EEGs throughout multiple units with, with neuro, neurolo, uh, neurologic or neurocritical care consultation. Um, you know, especially in our ICU, there's varying statistics, but you know, around 15% of people can have non-convulsive seizures during their stay. Um, and the problem is that for the most part, from what we understand, non-convulsive seizures do cause parenchymal brain injury. Um, the scalp EEG is not as sensitive as sometimes that we need. Um, and so the reasons that we use EEG are one, to characterize episode shaking spells in the ICU. Because a lot of people can shake for a variety of reasons that not necessarily seizures. Monitor someone who doesn't have an exam or is comatose and be able to see if that seizures are contributing to that. But also something that I know that um, you know, Gabe and I were just talking about along with Casey is doing EEG in the post-cardiac arrest folks during their cooling and rewarming phases. Um, for seizure detection, because certainly there's a high percentage, especially during the rewarming phase, um, but also for prognostication and trying to be able to standardize prognostication along groups. Looking at things like reactivity, do they have a meaningful response um, to the external environment? Do they have really malignant patterns, such as a burst suppression kind of suppression burst pattern um, that suggests that that person has a poor prognosis kind of from the get-go? Um, can be really helpful, especially as we're kind of increasingly being asked with these post-arrest groups that are on ECMO, um, what should we do? Are these procedures things that does this person have a meaningful outcome to be able to go through their emergent operation? Um, so EG for that's kind of uh, kind of trying to ramp up that uh, process, trying to get more people hooked up to be able to help with that as a standardized process. Um, 
We're also doing EEG for delayed cerebral ischemia detection, severe subarachnoid hemorrhage patients grade three to five on HASS score, um, especially with limited uh, clinical exams. Um, kind of day three to 10, that's a little, there's definitely paper out there that shows that it's predictive of that. Um, how you can implement that clinically is still to be determined. And then something that's probably the most interesting from an academic standpoint is using intracranial depth electrodes uh, in these patients that actually as part of a bundle of the other two things I'll talk about in a second, and placing intracranial depth electrodes to be able to detect things that you really can't on a scalp electrode because of kind of the thickness of the skull, et cetera. Um, and some things that we're being able to detect like cortical spreading depressions or depolarizations are providing a lot of insight of what happens to the really sick brain and maybe different avenues that we can take to be able to treat that. Um, so part of when I'm saying the bundle which certain centers are doing and something that we do at UH in, in certain cases is cerebral microanalysis. And I've talked about this a little bit in terms of localized care you know, versus global. Um, which would be more your ICPs or EGs, is this kind of global network and you're getting some focality, but not really. Um, cerebral microdose is an entire other end of the spectrum where you're placing a catheter in a very specific location and getting a very small sample size of what's happening on a cellular level there. Um, because it's so focal, location really matters. And you have to be very cognizant of where you're placing this and really plan out be able to say, are you placing this next to a lesion because you care about secondary damage around it, or are you trying to use this as an inference for a diffuse global phenomenon? Um, it's hard to know, and there's no right answer exactly where to place these, so you have to use it for your clinical judgment. Um, what we are able to do is there's a catheter that's placed, and there's a semi-permeal membrane, and you place dialysate that's very similar to CSF, and you get hourly samples. And at least at uh, our facility, what we're looking at is lactate, pyruvate, glucose, glycerol. Um, and then uh, making lactate pyruvate ratio to be able to determine anaerobic metabolism. There's certain cutoffs which are not defined broadly throughout the literature, but at least local uh, cutoffs that we use to be able to determine metabolic crisis. Um, and there's certain targets that we need to be able to treat. Does that person have just extraordinarily glucose and we bolus them systemically glucose? Um, it's hard to know what to do with these numbers necessarily. Um, sometimes and you have to take them as trends over time and you have to be able to take it as a diffuse kind of conglomeration of all the other data that you're capturing to be able to use that. And we'll talk about how to do that in a little bit. Um, but this is kind of it's exciting to be able to do and use for people with limited exams, but how we uh, transition that to a clinical decision is still pretty difficult if you ask everyone that's interpreting it for that side. Something that's a little bit more um, ramp in, and certainly something that's going to be uh, taking off a little bit at gravy is uh, brain tissue oxidation with Lycox monitors. Um, so you're measuring PBO2, uh, brain tissue oxidation, and there's a lot of things that factor that. And part of that is cerebral perfusion or blood flow, um, which is the part we really care about, hemoglobin concentrations, PaO2, and metabolic rate, including fever, pain, agitation, shivering, all the things that we know contribute to a metabolic demand of the brain. And then you can inference this if you're looking for basis spasm and say a subarachnoid or a post-traumatic um, basic constriction type phenomenon. Um, and so what recent trials boost to uh, what we're primarily talking about is that levels lower than 20 correlated to worse outcomes. And that was on like a, on a modified rank in uh, shift. And that was specifically in TBI patients. And so Boost 3 should be starting this fall, and Grady, from what I understand, is going to be one of those sites. So it'll be interesting to see how you use this in conjunction with an ICP monitor to make sure that, uh, that you're getting optimal perfusion and being able to augment on top of our normal parameters. Here are some of the devices I'm just going to point out. So most of you have probably seen what an EVD looks like in this pressure gradient uh, positioning in the frame and row. Um, this is what our uh, cerebral microanalysis looks like at bedside. It's this machine, and you literally take a sample from this percusate and uh, deposit it, and it gives you uh, lab samples pretty quickly to get about every hour. Um, so, like the Lycox monitor um, with uh, your ICP and your brain oxygenation, and then kind of different places that you're able to put these probes. And really, what we're talking about is these two, um, and then potentially a bulk, these two shift. Um, and so, that's kind of what they physically look like at the bedside. So really, what I'm talking about is getting a ton of different data points for someone that's basically impossible for any human mentally to be able to put together and make clinical decisions. Um, 
it's easy to be able to take two to four data points at a time and try to change things. But we're talking about tons of data and try to how to integrate that. Really, that's where bioinformatics is going to have to uh, play a role. Um, there's certain types of monitors now that try to do that for you and inference some of the ICP uh, parameters that we have, the Lycox, and try to put that in over monitor is probably the one that's the most compelling and least clinically available now. Um, how that's going to change clinical practice is still be determined. Um, how to be able to integrate that clinically is going to be the most important thing that we can do. Um, and so that's where a lot of the focus is right now, is the bioinformatics models of this. And I know certain people are looking at, at that to be able to uh, actually make this clinically meaningful. So, wrap up question. What is the most generally applicable use of multimodality monitoring? <laughs> Give me a second before I pull it up. Hopefully, we have some answers this time. Three so far. Five. Five. Six. There we go. Nine. All right. <laughs> so fundamentally, what you're trying to do is prevent secondary entry. That's via lots of data collection. You're right. Um, but the essence of it is trying to prevent secondary injury um, because you can't fix the primary. And really, what we deal with in the ICU is that whole cascade of everything that happens afterwards. And so, both those answers, I guess, are right. But really, the essence is to try to prevent that secondary injury. So, um, conclusions we got to find a way to be able to integrate this data to be able to make it meaningful. Um, what optimal bundle every person should have. It's difficult to know. Different centers do it differently. Different providers do it differently. Um, what exact patients need this is still a little bit of a gray area. Um, more needs to be done to know how to integrate this. And there's a lot of novel therapies that are coming out, and whether they're going to be better or not is to be to be determined. So, thank you.